On April 19, 1971, the first space station in history, Salyut 1, had just been placed in low Earth orbit by the Soviet Union. On June 6, 1971, the Soyuz 11 would undertake a journey to the orbiting space station with cosmonauts Georgi Dobrovolsky, Vladislav Volkov, and Viktor Patsayev inside. Three cosmonauts from the Soyuz 11 spacecraft successfully boarded the Salyut 1 space station on June 7, 1971. They were there for three weeks of research projects, including the growth of Chinese cabbage and bulb onions, the creation of star spectrograms, and the taking of photographs of the snow and ice on the river Volga from orbit. But what happened to these three cosmonauts? Let's find out while Elon Musk update us all. Hello everyone, welcome back to Elon Musk Evolution, where we bring you the most recent news about Elon Musk and his multi-billion dollar companies, space news, and the latest science and technology. But before we begin, make sure you subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon so you don't miss any of our amazing videos. According to Musk, it's a small wonder that only three people have lost in space out of 562 who have ventured beyond the safety of Earth. Five times as many people have perished as a result of crashes or explosions while escaping or re-entering our planet's atmosphere. They were now well-known heroes and frequently appeared on Soviet evening television. The Soyuz 11 finally separated from the Salyut 1 on June 29, 1971, after the cosmonauts' primary mission was finished. Three hours later, the astronauts fired their ship's engine to return to Earth. Vladislav Volkov made a humorous request to flight control, asking them to make sure their customary welcome home gift of cognac would be there when they landed. To separate the orbital bell-shaped capsule and instrument modules from the Soyuz 11 at 29 minutes before touchdown, and at a height of 160 kilometers, explosive charges were fired as directed. The cosmonauts' only protection from the raging furnace of re-entry was now the space capsule. Then, however, something unexpected transpired. The pressure inside the crew capsule rapidly dropped as soon as the other modules were jettisoned and all of the air inside started escaping into the vacuum of space. Unfortunately, mission control remained oblivious of the situation. There was a startling quiet when the cosmonauts tried to be reached on the VHF radio, which caused the room to become uneasy. The capsule was detected on radar as it entered Soviet airspace 22 minutes before touchdown. Mission controllers knew that while the capsule was still re-entering the atmosphere, it would be wrapped in a cloak of plasma, and consequently contact would be difficult during this period. Musk explained. As the minutes passed by, expectations for a happy ending were reignited when the space capsule's drogue parachute autonomously released, followed by the larger main parachute cover followed. But there continued to be no signal from the crew, and five minutes before touchdown, helicopter crews noticed the completely intact Soyuz 11 leisurely swinging back and forth under the flawless-looking parachute. When the chopper commander radioed that the capsule had landed safely, mission control was delighted. After spending three exhausting weeks in space, the recovery team was staying close by and was just minutes away from opening the hatch to give the cosmonauts their cognac and other home comforts. Two minutes after touchdown, the two-man search and rescue crew arrived at the Soyuz 11 and then pounded on the hull of the ship to alert them to their presence. However, there was silence from inside. After opening the hatch, a look of deeply disturbed uncertainty visible in the face of one of the rescue crews the recovery crew discovered the three cosmonauts all slumped and motionless inside the spacecraft. Blood was pouring out of their ears and noses, and their faces were painted in dark spots that appeared to be bruises. Although Dobrovolsky, one of the cosmonauts, was still warm, efforts to revive him ended in failure. The very first engagement between the recovery crew and mission control resulted in the use of three numbers, 111. According to Musk, this was a code that defined the health of the cosmonauts. The numbers 5 indicated excellent condition, 4 indicated good condition, 3 indicated there were injuries, 2 indicated there were significant injuries, and 1 indicated there were fatal injuries. And now, let's take a closer look at what went wrong. Investigators concluded Dobrovolsky and Volkov had unbuckled themselves from their seats to look for the leak that was letting air escape from the capsule based on the positions of the three cosmonauts' bodies when they were discovered. Their heart rates increased while they searched, according to their hot monitors. However, time was not on their side, as within only 50 seconds, Patsayev's pulse fell as his body became starving for oxygen, and then within 110 seconds, all three crew members had died in the process. 
Officials had discovered that a defective valve was the main reason of the unfortunate incident. The entire nation mourned their passing, and their funeral was epic on a grand scale. All human space flights were put on hold by the Soviet Union while engineers overhauled the Soyuz spacecraft. Now, during takeoffs and landings, all cosmonauts are required to don spacesuits. Musk pointed out that other nations have also experienced space disasters that claim the lives of valiant astronauts. With the brilliant engineering of the reusable space shuttle, the U.S. was setting the standard for space travel worldwide. However, issues can arise with even the most sophisticated spacecraft. After the first space shuttle launch on April 12, 1981, and after Americans had grown accustomed to seeing the space shuttle launch, the U.S. appeared to be growing bored with space travel by January 1986. Since its first flight, the program had run without any issues. However, everything would soon shift. On the dawn of January 28, 1986, the crews of mission STS-51L boarded the spacecraft Challenger. It was a beautiful but cold Tuesday morning. Everywhere in the USA, Americans were a little more enthusiastic with this launch because its crew of seven astronauts included payload expert Krista McAuliffe, who was a housewife, school teacher, and mother of two children. She was an active participant in the Teacher in Space initiative and living proof that everyone in America could now travel into space, not just the best fighter pilots. Ellison Onizuka, Judith Resnick, and Ronald McNair were among the mission specialists operating the Challenger shuttle under Dick Scobie's command. Gregory Jarvis was Krista McAuliffe's fellow payload expert. Krista McAuliffe was aboard the Space Shuttle Challenger when it took off from Cape Canaveral, Florida, making history as the first regular American to travel into space. However, after just 73 seconds and with hundreds of spectators on the ground watching, which include Krista's family and a small group of students, and millions of spectators waiting to watch the launch on television, the space shuttle disintegrated into a fireball and smoke. So what really happened? We noted that the morning was extremely cold. In reality, two hours before the launch, there was ice on the tower. An overnight measurement made by the ice crew revealed readings on the left solid rocket booster at minus 4 degrees Celsius, while the right SRB was minus 13 degrees Celsius. The temperatures of the solid rocket boosters were not included in the launch commit criteria. Hence, these measurements were only taken for engineering purposes and were not published. The solid rocket boosters for the shuttle are composed of four segments that are bolted together at three O-ring joints before we continue. These O-rings are in place to hold internal pressure of the SRB, and any failure of these O-rings would generate a burn-through, triggering a catastrophic engine failure. To the right solid rocket booster, this is exactly what transpired. Right before liftoff, there was a cloud of black smoke from the SRB, indicating that the O-ring had already failed. Flames began to emerge from the broken O-ring by the time the shuttle was in the air, and the sideways flame sliced through the SRB like a cutting torch. The seven astronauts, the $1.2 billion spaceship, and its satellite payload perished in space instantaneously. The cold played a major role in the accident. Engineers were aware of the risks to the O-rings at such low temperatures because the launch was conducted in weather that was minus 3 degrees Celsius. Nevertheless, despite numerous engineer cautions, the shuttle was given the all-clear to launch. Following this terrible tragedy, NASA suspended the space shuttle program for two years while its engineers completely redesigned the shuttle's various parts. However, it wouldn't be the final space shuttle mishap. In April 1981, the space shuttle Columbia was the first shuttle to be launched into space. 27 more times after its maiden flight, the shuttle launched again, and it was on its 28th flight on January 16, 2003. The seven-person STS-107 crew included flight engineer Kalpana Chola, who had previously flown on the mission, mission commander Rick D. Husband, pilot William C. McCool, payload commander Michael P. Anderson, Israeli astronaut Ilan Ramon, who served as a payload specialist, and U.S. Space Shuttle Mission STS-87, David M. Brown and Laurel Blair Salton Clark, our Navy captains, who were flying as mission specialists. There were no obvious issues during the launch. During their 16-day expedition, the astronauts successfully completed 80 science and research projects while working in two alternating shifts, 24 hours a day. The crew needed to head back to Earth, and the Space Shuttle Columbia was due to re-enter the atmosphere and touch down on February 1, 2003. The entry flight control team at Mission Control began their shift at 2.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. 
The crew organized their belongings inside the orbiter and got ready for re-entry. Husband with McCool started going through the entry checklist, and at 1.10 p.m., the Columbia crew was authorized to perform their de-orbit burn, where it lasted 2 minutes and 38 seconds. At 1.44 p.m., Columbia re-entered the atmosphere at a height of 120 kilometers, four and a half minutes later. A sensor began measuring a greater than normal amount of force on the left wing. However, the data from the sensor was sent to an internal recorder and was not visible to the crew or ground controllers. The increased drag resulted in the orbiter starting to yaw to the left. The problem was fixed by the orbiter's flight control system, and the crew was never made aware of the drag or what was going on, Musk stated. Sensors then showed issues with the hydraulic systems on the left wing and the left side landing gear's tire pressure dropped. The last communication from Columbia was received by flight controllers as it was traveling at a speed of 20,120 kilometers per hour and was 60 kilometers above the Earth. The orbiter broke up and disintegrated as many witnesses watched in horror on video. What transpired to the crew of the Columbia? Following Columbia's launch, the Intercenter Photo Working Group of NASA was performing a routine review of the launch videos. It wasn't until the second day that they discovered a piece of foam had broken off from the massive external tank and damaged the left wing as the shuttle was rising into orbit. Multiple requests for images were made to the U.S. Department of Defense after the debris management team was unable to assess the left wing's damage. A request was sent to the U.S. Strategic Command, which started looking for equipment that could take pictures of the orbiter. However, after learning who made the request, NASA Mission Management Team Chair Linda Hamm rejected the request for an image. She didn't ask the debris assessment team. Instead, she asked a flight director about the imaging requirement. It would have interfered with ongoing science operations to move the orbiter into a position to be photographed, and Hamm regarded the Department of Defense's imaging capabilities as insufficient to assess damage to Columbia's left wing. Now here is when things get more intriguing. In communications with the Columbia crew, mission management downplayed the risk of a debris strike, and flight director Steve Stitch emailed Husband and McCool to inform them of the strike and to reassure them that there was no need to worry about damage because foam strikes had happened on earlier flights. They were obviously mistaken. This was the smoking gun that established that Columbia's demise and the loss of her crew were caused by the damage from the debris strike. It was the final space shuttle launch, and this marked the end of the space shuttle program. Since then, the Russian Soyuz program and now SpaceX's rockets have been used to launch astronauts into space. And that ends today's episode. What do you think of this episode? Let us know in the comment box below. Please subscribe and don't forget to like today's video. We'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.